Hi, I'm Moby. I'm Lindsay. And thank you for joining us for another episode installment of Moby Pod. We're going to try and talk about a bunch of different things. One, first and foremost, is we're going to talk about anxiety again, because you and I are both very prone to anxiety. And sadly, over the years, I've had to learn a whole bunch of coping skills to deal with anxiety. So we're going to talk about what those different coping skills are. We're also going to talk about the blue zones. A little bit, lightly, going to touch on it. And we're going to talk about like the nutrition aspect of it, like what makes a blue zone. Hopefully at some point, Dan Butner will come on the show. We're also going to talk about how Dan makes me feel bad about myself because he's so much better at being a human being than I am. Like he knows how to do things. And I don't, I don't, I mean, do you know how to ride a bike across the Sahara Desert? I know how to ride a bike. I bet I could figure it out in the desert. Mm, I could not. And we're also going to talk, we're going to uh, look at some viewer mail and we're going to do our best to build a choir. And if you don't know what that means, hopefully by the end of the episode, it'll make perfect sense and you'll be astounded at how two people in the space of three minutes can build an 80 person choir. By just going like this. Uh, uh. Yep, that's how you build, that's, that's, that's how you build a choir. So once again, thank you for coming to Moby Pod. And now let's get started talking. Wait, we're already talking. Let's go do Moby Pod. So, Moby, I was um, having a hard time sleeping the other night. I was very anxious. I was thinking about something, a little a little uh, repetitive, obsessive thinking about something. And what I did was I did something that you taught me like a year ago, which is I laid there and I tried to walk through the halls of an old high school, one of the high schools that I went to and tried to remember all the hallways. And guess what happened? I fell asleep like a little baby and woke (laughs) up in the morning. I've never quite understood that expression, sleep like a baby. Why, because babies are notoriously bad sleepers? Well, I remember John McCain, back when Republicans were reasonably sane, well, (laughs) sort of sane, um, he, after he lost the 2008 election, he was on the David Letterman show. Mm Mm-hmm. And David Letterman said, so, Senator McCain, how have you been doing since you lost the election? And John McCain said, you know what, Dave? You know, I've been sleeping like a baby. I fall asleep for 30 minutes and wake up crying and screaming. John McCain said that? Yeah, it was really it was That's really funny. He's a really funny guy. Um, wow. Okay, so we, we were talking about your anxiety <laughs> and insomnia, yes. and I then segued into an old guy political reference. No, that's fascinating because I always knew John McCain was kind of a little cutie. Didn't always agree, but thought he was a cute sweetie. Yeah. So what happened was I did the trick, the tool that you taught me for when I'm spiraling and it allowed me to actually fall asleep, which I couldn't do for hours until I remembered that thing that you had taught me. And I do it occasionally from time to time, even in the middle of the day, if I start to like go down a bad path and I can feel myself start to like get the blinders of anxiety on. That is one thing that really helped me is just taking a breath and trying to re imagine all the hallways of my high school I went to in Georgia. It actually, for some reason, really, really grounds and centers me and like redirects my brain, which has, it's changed my connection to panic and anxiety because I think before that, and before I found this tool that actually works for me, and I've, I've had others in the past, but this one works. It has helped me to not only manage anxiety, but manage the fear I have around anxiety coming into my current state of being because the anxiety is bad, but also my fear about having anxiety is also bad. So it's really helped both of those things because now I know I have a tool. So because I know this is only one of the many things that you use when you start to panic, in addition to, and we talked about ambient music and how much it helps you, but I know that you have a very extensive toolbox of other tools of things that you use when you start to panic. And I was wondering if you might share with me and our listener friends <laughs> some of your other, the other things that you do. Sure. And it's one of these things, like as an insecure man who sometimes feels the need to overcompensate, like there's some <laughs> things that I'd love to be an expert on. And then there are other things 
that I'm really sad that I've become an expert on. <laughs> like, for example, anxiety. And what you're referring to is like the toolbox. I think that's a 12-step program expression. Maybe it's just a general self-help program expression of the spiritual tools that you have in your toolbox, mm -hmm. you know, and spiritual sounds esoteric. And in this case, they're very practical. Mm -hmm. So I wish, I'm glad I know the things that are in my toolbox. I wish I didn't have to know them because it's all the product of me being congenitally or culturally inclined towards panic. And so at an early age, I had to start learning how to manage panic. We talked about this before. Like, I dropped out of college because of anxiety attacks. Mm -hmm. I've ended relationships because of anxiety attacks. I've avoided so many things because of panic. So sadly, I've had to do tons and tons of research, making myself sort of an expert. And again, I wish I wasn't. I wish I, I, wish I could just be happy-go-lucky and know nothing about panic attacks and know nothing about how to deal with anxiety. Mm -hmm. But what you're describing is basically an interruption tool. Because what I find is panic is obsessive. You know, the amygdala, which is sort of the seat of panic. It's a little part of the brain and it hijacks the entire brain with anxiety. The amygdala, it's a part of your brain that is a, a fear response, right? That is what the amygdala does is it is it triggers fear, which then has a whole other I mean, this like, is, series of things that it causes. I wish I knew more about neuroscience. I just know that the amygdala is kind of little. I guess it's like the a baby. shape of an almond. Yeah, it's like a little baby grape. But for such a tiny thing, it completely hijacks the brain. And my limited understanding is that, very broadly speaking, there are two systems in the brain. There's the sympathetic nervous system, which is not sympathetic, and the parasympathetic <laughs> nervous system, which is kinder to us. So the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight system, mm -hmm. which kept our ancestors alive. And the sympathetic nervous system is the one that trigger. it floods your body with cortisol. It floods your body with adrenaline, norepinephrine. I think it's norepinephrine. I forget. The, the stress hormones. Mm -hmm. And it's a great way to run away from a bear or fight an intruder. Mm -hmm. But the problem, if there's no bear to run away from or if there's no intruder to fight, this fight or flight system, it kicks in and it doesn't know, it doesn't stop. Mm-hmm. Like, it's designed to be fairly quick and episodic. Like, oh, that person's going to stab me with a spear. I need to run away or stop them. Right. And then once you've run away or stopped them, the sympathetic nervous system would slow down. Mm -hmm. And the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the calm nervous system, would kick in and allow you to rest and allow you to heal. Mm -hmm. But as mentioned, if it's 3 o'clock in the morning and what you're panicking about is a thought... Mm -hmm. The brain just like keeps panicking because there's nothing real. I mean, it feels real. Because mm -hmm. the thought is telling you this is life or death and yeah. you have to fix this or we die. Is yeah. essentially, I mean, if you boil it all the way down, that's probably what the thought is oh, telling you. Oh, which is you. why it's so all-consuming, mm -hmm. because it kept our ancestors alive. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is too esoteric, but it's worth remembering the brain doesn't know anything. You know, the brain is a weird, incredibly vulnerable organism locked in a box. It doesn't have eyes. It doesn't have any, it doesn't even have sense nerves. Mm -hmm. All it does is respond to the information fed to it it by our eyes, by our skin, by our ears, by our nose, by our mouth. Mm -hmm. And so the brain is constantly responding. And when it detects the slightest whiff of especially historical fear, it responds as if the house is on fire. Right. So then the question is, okay, how do we get our poor little brains to stop panicking at three o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the afternoon? And so what you're describing is that interruption and yes, which in the past has been hard because I think there's a difference between distraction and true interruption. Because I think pre previously to knowing this tool, I would try to distract myself with other things, clean something, call a friend, go for a walk, which those things do help. But there's something about this where I can really latch on to a different pathway in my brain that's made it very different. And my experience is so, for example, this one of like remembering walking down hallways in your mind in a school that you went to, mm -hmm. revisiting a house that you grew up in, mm -hmm. um, revisiting a daily walk that you took. An office you used to work at, a job you used to have, something like that. 
that. And there's something, my understanding is there's something very mundane about that. And the brain almost says, oh, if we're engaged in something this mundane, things must be okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's almost like the amygdala is saying, well, I assumed things were terrible, but if we can do something as mundane and boring as remember what the hallways in our junior high school were like, (laughs) clearly things are not life and death. And so it's basically sending a signal to your brain that things are okay. So you mentioned some of the other things in my anti-anxiety toolbox. Yeah, what are they? I want to know. So one of my favorites is you could say it's a mindfulness practice combined with gratitude. And for me, the question is, and this happened a few years ago, I was having some mind-melting 2 a.m. panic attack. And all of a sudden it dawned on me like what I was panicking about had nothing to do with my physical reality, Mm -hmm. you know. And then I just thought to myself, okay, let me describe my reality right now. And I was lying in bed. I was warm. It was cold outside. I had had dinner earlier, so I was fed. It was dark. It was quiet. I was safe. And it really just struck me, well, if I'm safe, why is my brain responding like I'm being attacked by an army of bears? So the process or the practice is you, and this is a big part of mindfulness, is you just sort of identify the things that you're perceiving. So you start with what you can see. If it's during the day, you look around, you're like, well, I see that. I see that. You're not saying, I love what I see. You're saying, okay, I see that. And then if you want to, what I find really powerful is you add a gratitude element to it. So an example would be like in the middle of the night, suppose I wake up and I'm panicking And the first thing I do is be like, okay, so where am I? Okay, I'm in my room. It's dark. It's quiet. It's safe. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, what can I see? And I'll be like, well, actually, it's dark. I can't see anything. And then I'll attach gratitude to that. I'll be like, well, isn't that great that it's the middle of the night and I'm in a space that's dark and visually peaceful? And I'll be so grateful for that. And then you'll move on to like, what can I feel with my skin? I'm like, well, I feel my soft sheets and they're nice and cool, but they're warm enough and I'll be grateful for attached gratitude to that. And then what can I smell? It's like, oh, I just smell the normal things in my room. I don't smell disgusting Febreze. I don't smell other people's (laughs) cigarette smoke. I can be grateful for that. And then lastly, what do I hear? And I'll be like, oh, I hear my breathing and maybe I hear some birds. And I'll be like, isn't this amazing? I'm in a quiet, dark space where the temperature is nice. And at this point, I've calmed down. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the anxiety is so intense, you just have to keep doing it. That's a practice that I find very easy to do at 2 o'clock in the morning or anytime. Um, So here's a cognitive behavioral therapy trick that is great. (laughs) And this is really like this, if this will take anxiety for me from 80% to 40%. And it's so easy to remember. That's the key with a lot of these tricks is they have to be easy to remember and easy to do. Because if it's three o'clock in the morning and you're panicking, your brain can only latch onto the simple stuff. Mm -hmm. So true. So here's a really good one. It's A, B, C, D. So A is activating event. What activated the anxiety? Who knows what it could be different for every person, obviously, but you identify specifically the thing that activated the anxiety. Mm -hmm. And then B is what's the belief that you have about the anxiety? So let's say like, let's say you found out that someone you love is sick and that's causing anxiety. So A would be the activating event. Okay, that person I love is sick. Mm -hmm. B, the belief, oh no, this is going to kill them. Oh no, this is going to be disastrous. Oh no, this is going to be expensive. It's the, it's the panic belief. C is to challenge that belief. And you simply say, okay, there's a good chance it won't kill them. There's a good chance it won't be catastrophic. But then here's the, the beauty of this. D is to dispute the belief with evidence. And so you say, okay, let's say the person's name is Bill. Well, Bill was sick a year ago and it didn't kill him. And it was annoying, but we got through it. And Bill Mm -hmm. was sick three years ago and clearly didn't kill him then. And it wasn't that expensive and we got through it. And the more you dispute it with evidence, the more your brain calms down. 
instead of just saying to your brain, don't be anxious, you're saying, here's specifically why you shouldn't be anxious. Yeah, self-soothing. Yeah. So many of us are not good at self-soothing. Let me tell you this story really quick, not to interrupt your flow of tricks, but I do think <laughs> that it's it was incredibly meaningful to me. So I have these beautiful, amazing friends, Christy and Cassie, and they recently had um, this beautiful, beautiful baby. And I went over there one day for dinner and I had Bagel with me and the baby was getting upset because Bagel was coming up and licking her little baby toes, which I totally get. And I was like, relatable Bagel, I want to want to touch those little baby toes too. She's so cute. But the baby was getting really anxious about it. And she was probably like two at this point, two and a half. And she was not, she was having a hard time finding her words and she was getting really anxious. She was starting to like half cry, half yell, like the anxiety was amping up. And her mom, Cassie, looks at her and goes, I can tell you're getting upset. And Edie, the baby was like, yes, like in her baby terms was like, yes, I am. And then Cassie goes, okay, and what do we do when we start to feel upset? And this two-year-old baby sits back in her high chair and just goes, Wow. So the- and took three deep breaths and sat with her for a minute. And Cassie goes, do you feel a little bit better now? And she just started eating her dinner again. Wow. So they're teaching this baby coping mechanisms, coping skills, self-soothing from a young age. And I am far along in my life. And I'm recently only learning how to self-soothe in a productive way, because I think we all learned ways to self-soothe that are incredibly toxic, like eating food that's bad for you or drinking more than you should or buying something you can't afford, something to like distract you, make mm-hmm. yourself feel better, toxic coping skills. And I'm trying to learn positive ones now, but watching this baby do it at two, I was like, oh my God, this is such a beautiful thing to watch someone learn so early in their life. And she's going to be so much better because of it. Well, sort of what you're describing, there is, I forget what it's called, but there's a type of therapy that involves that practice. And the the practice of basically inhabiting who you are as an adult and almost having like parent conversations with yourself, Mm -hmm. you know, and saying to yourself, don't worry, I will make this okay. Mm -hmm. I'm an adult. I will take care of this. You Mm -hmm. know, like, I know you're scared, but it's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. And it can be surprisingly effective. I've done forms of therapy where they have you write letters to your younger self who it's the young part of you that's triggered in these moments. And so you write a letter to yourself at that age. And I actually find it to be really helpful. And what they had their daughter do is, I mean, the power of breath work is also phenomenal for dealing with anxiety. Yeah. I mean, I would add that it's in my toolbox of the easiest one to remember is what's called box breathing, Mm -hmm. you know, where depending on what the count is, what you're comfortable with, like breathe in for a count of six, hold for a count of six, exhale for a count of six. Hold the exhale for a count of six, breathe in for a count of six, just like in, hold, out, hold, in, hold, out, hold. And if you put your hands on your stomach when you're doing it, it can also be very calming. Mm-hmm. But that one's I'm, really helpful for me too, the box breathing. So that's definitely in my anti anxiety toolbox. And it's easy to remember. That's what I mean. Again, part of my criteria for these is can I remember to do them at three o'clock in the morning? Because again, three o'clock in the morning when your brain is addled by anxiety, it can't really do much of anything. Mm -hmm. So all of these things I'm saying, like, I'm not saying that these are things I've read about or things that I've heard are effective. These are all things that I've tried, sadly, thousands of times, (laughs) thousands and thousands of times. And they all do work. Sometimes... You have to use a few of them. Sometimes you have to use one more than, you know, a couple of times in the course of a night. But like I have found all of these things do work. And there's one other tool that I find really helpful. Mm -hmm. The role of adversity in general, because everyone, myself included, we all hate adversity. I mean, who likes being sick? Who likes having insomnia? Who likes being depressed? Who likes having anxiety? But 
when I remember all those times in my past when I've had anxiety or been sick or been hurt or been depressed, it helps now. You know, like, for example, uh, I was recently in New York and I had really bad insomnia, you know, like mm -hmm. 24 hours, no sleep. But then I remembered that five or 10 other times in my life I've had crippling insomnia. And I was like, oh, I got through it then. I can get through this. And it really can help to just sort of like, I call it the adversity bank. <laughs> You know, when something terrible happens, just make sure that you remember it the next time something terrible happens, because every experience with adversity we have sort of teaches us that we can deal with whatever adversity is coming our way. Yeah. So a quick little recap. One is that sort of like the we'll call it like the mundane memory, mm -hmm. you know, the memory of walking through the junior high school or the high school or the elementary school or the house you grew up in, just like walking through it and observing it. Mm -hmm. Not with people in it, not anything. You're just, you're just remembering the physical space or even like a hike you went on yesterday. Mm -hmm. So that's one that you find really helpful. I love that one. Um, the other would be, we'll call it like mindful combined with gratitude. It's like just simply being aware of what's actually going on in your immediate circumstances. Mm -hmm. You're not extrapolating. You're not like thinking, oh, what's going on around the corner? You're just like, what can I see? What can I smell? What can I taste? What can I feel? What can I hear? Mm -hmm. Your five senses and possibly for each one, try and be grateful, you know, to simply like if you're anxious in the middle of the day being like, OK, well, you know what? I had a really nice lunch. I'm fed. You mm -hmm. know, I'm looking out a window and guess what? There's some trees. That's nice. You know, it's like a little bit of gratitude sort of helps the the experience sink in. Mm -hmm. What were the others? A, B, C, D. Oh, A, B, C, D. Wouldn't it be A, B, C, D, and E? Because it's... it's you dis um, But you dispute, dispute with, evidence. with evidence. So D and E are sort of... A D with E. Yeah. What's the activating anxiety event, the belief around it, you challenge the belief, and then you dispute the belief with evidence. Um, then we talked about box breathing. Mm -hmm. Oh, one other is uh, progressive relaxation. That means toes. Like your flex foot, things. Your, your heel. Yeah. You're like working your way up your body of like, these are this is my body. These are my body parts. Yeah. And like willing parts, your body to relax or flexing parts of your body and releasing. Mm -hmm. Like flex your face muscles, release them. Flex your face muscles, flex your, flex your hands, release them. Like it's mm -hmm. that can burn through some of the stress chemicals that are designed to help us run away from bears, not maligning bears. It doesn't. It could have been a bear or a snake or a panther. More likely, uh, like just some or another other, human. Yeah, yeah. Some, <laughs> some some super angry other person trying to steal our corns. Right. Oh no, not the corns. If you have ways that you manage your anxiety that you want to share with us, uh, email them. We're fascinated by what works for you. Um, so I recently got Dan Buettner's The Blue Zones on my Audible, and I started listening to it, and oh my god, this book is fascinating. So this book, what it aims to do is to figure out what these people are doing in these blue zones where people live to be 100 plus. And so I'm just like listening to it and I'm like, oh my gosh, they are all eating beans. Like they're all eating very whole foods. They're all very active. They all have a lot of community in their life. And it's just so, so interesting to me. Like he's in Sardinia, which I will say as a lover of a fancy wine every now and again, <laughs> which I can't drink them often because I do get too hungover and it makes me very, very sad. So I have to be very selective about my wine moments these days, especially as I age. Um, you could just start an entire sort of like wine blog just called Wine Moments with Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> Where I have like two glasses of wine a week and, and they, both, they all make me want to die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I do love, in, from, the, from Sardinia, there's a grape called Cannonau that ha is like briny and very has a lot of tannins and I, I really love that wine and apparently it has a lot of flavonoids in it like dark chocolate 
I'm very, very excited of my journey of finishing this book. I'm definitely already starting to like shift my own perspective on how I should conduct my day to day life because it's not about one thing or one kind of vitamin. It's all of these things together of activity, community, diet, stress levels, all of these things working together that are what is creating longevity in these people. Also, I no. think there is some element of their genes in these communities. Although, um, I mean, the, the blue zones, the centenarians are scattered all over the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the people on the island in Japan, the Loma Linda people mm -hmm. in the United the States. The Koya Peninsula. So it's, they're so scattered, it's hard to say that there is a genetic component. I mean, maybe there is, but like, it's kind of like, clearly there's no inherent relationship between like people in Sardinia and people on an island in Japan. Right. And then go another seven or 8,000 miles to people in Loma Linda, California. Right, right. But what you're describing, because, you know, ever since I went vegan in 1987, I've been obsessed with nutrition. Yes, I know. We were just, when my uncles were in town, I was having, because they have all these issues and you were telling them, this is what you need to eat for this, is that you are, you've become such another thing out of necessity, but also you're really good at it. Knowing what foods to eat to fix certain ailments, but also just overall what is best for the human body. And, and in, when in doubt, it's unprocessed whole foods. Try to always focus on that. Like one other key is the darker the food, the better. You know, for example, like everything you just mentioned, like those grapes in Sardinia, they're black grapes. Mm -hmm. You know, and black means that there's a high amount of polyphenols. Um, anthocyanins, and th that's what makes it dark. Mm -hmm. Same thing with blueberries. Blueberries are dark because of the anthocyanins, which is a really powerful type of antioxidant. You were also saying the other day, if you can choose between a, a white potato and a purple potato. Go with the purple potato. Yeah, get the darker option always. White cabbage or red cabbage, go with the red cabbage. Mm -hmm. White grape or red grape, go with the red or black grape. Like when in doubt, just go with the dark food because that the dark just means it has more antioxidants. Mm -hmm. And it's a real, it's a, a funny thing because like if I, if I really am honest about this, we're also talking about, uh, should I veer into the sort of, quasi spiritual esoteric realm of this if you must okay <laughs> normally i keep this to myself not that it's interesting but to me it, it makes so much sense to me and it's a huge part of my spiritual life but i don't talk about it that often i mean i'm a vegan for animal rights reasons for climate reasons but also for spiritual reasons mm -hmm. these plants heal us. These mm -hmm. plants are magic. I mean, like, to me, it's just, it's indicative of some sort of spiritual system that is unknowable to us. Mm -hmm. You know, that's so complicated where you take a grape seed and you put it in the ground, the little grape seed, little baby grape seed that can last for thousands of years. You know, they found seeds in the in Egyptian tombs that were thousands of years old. They still sprouted thousands of years later. And it grows and it just turns water, sunlight, and soil into the most complicated chemical, biological organism, a black grape or a black bean or a cabbage or a broccoli that is so distinct. And basically, every part of it will heal us. Mm -hmm. The fiber will heal us, the antioxidants, the polyphenols. Isn't that amazing that like you get to eat something? Like to me, it's like a sacrament. You know, this idea that you get to put something in your body and sure, it fills you up, keeps you from being hungry, but it heals you. It heals your brain. It protects your immune system. It protects you from all sorts of illnesses. Like, I just think that's so unbelievable. I know I keep asking, as we're doing in the podcast, I keep asking, like, do I sound like a crazy person? Am I rambling on too, too much? So no, you're not rambling on. You're just making me sad that my cashew milk ice cream doesn't heal me. I mean, cashew milk ice cream is great. Don't get me wrong. And also, <laughs> yeah. cashews and cashew milk ice cream, there are ingredients in that that will have antioxidants that are really powerful just because it's made out of plants. Mm -hmm. There's almost no such thing as a plant that doesn't have phenomenal antioxidants. Like, you'd be hard-pressed to find anything that grows in the plant world that doesn't have antioxidants. Well, right, but I think when you process it, and you take all the good stuff out of it, you know. Well, that's the other thing is antioxidants only work 
within the plant that they're grown in. That like so, like for example, synthesized antioxidants don't really do anything. Antioxidants removed from the plant and sold in capsule form can actually be dangerous. You know, some of them, especially the fat soluble ones, can be toxic. But also, you don't know what's in there. They could be filling it up with sawdust and charging yeah. <laughs> you fifty bucks. You don't know. But for example, like broccoli, you could never eat too much broccoli. And the antioxidants in broccoli will always protect you and always do everything in their power to keep you healthy. Oh, another magical thing. Um, I had this, con you know, Neil Bernard, we should have Neil on the show. Neil, uh, I don't know, Neil, he started the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Oh. And he is, he and Dr. Greger, Michael Greger, I'd say are like two of the foremost vegan doctors on the planet. But why isn't every doctor vegan is what I really why want Why isn't to know. every veterinarian vegan? That really also confuses that. me. It's like your day job is saving animals and at night you go and eat animals. Like However, I met one veterinarian that made me understand how veterinarians aren't all vegans, which is there was this guy when I first got bagel and I took her in because she was very, very sick, you know? And he goes, let me just remind you about something. This is not just, this is not a pet. It's not your child. It's not your baby. This is a dog and you need to treat it like a dog. And I was like, I, I don't know what you mean. And then I went and I looked up reviews on this guy's and apparently he once tackled a dog like he was a football player in his office because he wanted to show them how to dominate a dog. Okay. And I was like, well, I guess I can't go back there. And now I found a really nice lady, but I'm just saying this veterinarian was a real asshole. Yeah, it sounds like he might have some personal issues that, he, yeah. But um, Dr. Neil Bernard, I was having a conversation with him in D.C. a couple of years ago because I was very confused about something. Like, as we know, like most people eat way too much sugar. Mm -hmm. And there's even the issue of people eating way too much fructose. So one would then logically think, for example, a black grape is incredibly sweet. Blueberries are incredibly sweet. I can't eat too many of them because they're high in sugar. Guess what? Hmm. The fiber and the antioxidants in fruit mean that you don't have to worry about how sweet they are, hmm. especially like a dark fruit, like a blueberry or a black grape. Like it's so laden with fiber and antioxidants, like you don't have a glycemic spike as a result of eating it, which is, again, like going back to my quasi-spiritual aspect of seeing food as a sacrament. Like, isn't that amazing that we're not supposed to eat sugar, but you can eat as many black grapes as you want? That is amazing. And I'm very grateful for that because I do love a black grape. So Blue Zone. So we should definitely have Dan on because... He knows, you know, he also, he rode a bike across the Sahara Desert. So like on one hand, I really like Dan Buettner. But on the other hand, I kind of resent people who are so much better at living than I am. This guy's good at living, man. He's smart and he's good at living from what I can tell. And I only know little like, tidbits. I'm sure if I knew more, I would be like... Very intimidated. Like I mean, I'm already pretty intimidated. These people but. who know how to do stuff, because I, I don't really know how to do all that much. Like a friend of mine in Connecticut, he knows how to build furniture. I don't know how to build furniture. Like I was on his deck once and he had these Adirondack chairs that he had built. And I was like, how would you even know how to do that? Like, would you go to the Adirondack chair kit store? And he's like, no, he just went to the lumber store, got some lumber, figured out, and he figured out how to like do plumbing. And I just, it, these people who make me feel like such an inadequate human being, because like, I know how to like, I can make a smoothie. Well, we're talking about your incredible knowledge of anti-anxiety tools and what to eat to heal yourself. And we may even later talk about how to build a chorus. You know how to do a lot of things, maybe not build a chair, but there's lots of skills that you have. But are any of them practical like you know for how example, to clean a house i'm really good at cleaning houses i forget <laughs> have we i forget on the podcast have we talked about how good i am at cleaning because that's one of the only well, things i'll brag when about when you want to because your cups are dirty but everything else They're you clean. have is incredibly clean okay my cups are not dirty they just look dirty. they are stained and it <laughs> i will i will sort of bring us back to my embarrassing quasi-spiritual sacrament aspect of plants. The cups are stained with tannins from tea. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and tannins are also tannins. Tannins can be a little complicated because they can prevent the absorption of some nutrients, but they're also a phenomenal protective polyphenol as well. And also, I have cups that are not stained, and those are the ones are like if if someone was coming, like if you came over for tea, I would serve you tea in an unstained cup. But if you wanted to, I could show you my stained cups because I've given up trying to get the stain out of them and they are just inside these cups it's basically black and it's it's hard to hear it's hard to hear that i'm very proud of my tannin stained <laughs> cups okay so dan butner will have dan come on the show hopefully i hope he can that would be really cool we'll ask him and he will come on and i will tell him to his face how much i resent the fact that he's so good at being alive and he knows how to do all these things like ride a bike across the sahara desert no one knows how to do that well it's just riding a bike really but in a really hard place maybe you have to figure out i mean they don't have stores yeah true how do you do that what do you just have sandwiches for days yeah bring i mean that thing how do you know how to and also like sleeping outside like i don't know how to sleep outside. oh yeah i wouldn't be able to do that that would be hard for me yeah. i'm more of a glamper <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> So, um, in any case, so we'll, we'll ask Dan, Dan, if he's listening, Dan, please come on the show and make us feel bad about ourselves because you know how to live better than we do. And also you're smart and you know about nutrition and how people live to be over 100 years old. Also, something that you guys I think will really connect on is your love of soup making. I am. OK, I just made soup on Saturday mm-hmm. and it was it's so good. You're very good at soup. OK, so can I tell you what? Because it, it's also it only took an hour. It's very, very quick. Great. Yeah, I want to know all about the soup. Okay, maybe we could even at some point v- film it so people can see how to make the soup because it's real easy. You take lentils and quinoa and you put them in a pot with water and you boil. For how long? 50 minutes. Almost an hour. And towards the end, when, it, when both are cooked, you add frozen corn. In a second pot, you take chopped up purple potatoes and... Orange carrots. How chopped are we talking here? Man, little like, bitty tiny cubes. Not too tiny, but chunks. just like chunks. You you chop up, you chunk up some purple potatoes mm-hmm. and carrots, mm-hmm. and you boil them for about thirty or forty minutes. Well, these beans and quinoa are, are still cooking. going. So you got one pot with the beans and quinoa cooking, and one, corn, corns and in corns it now at the end. Okay. One pot with your potatoes and carrots boiling, and then about. 30 minutes in, you take chopped up onions, chopped up scallions, and chopped up leeks, Mm -hmm. which are in the allium family. It's also an incredibly healthy, powerful type of polyphenol. Allium? I thought that was lily. Is that the same? Yeah. Okay, great. I think so. A-L-L-I-U-M. It's like basically stuff that grows from a bulb, but it's it's a like really unique class of plant and it's super important for health. So you you saute your onion, oh, and garlic, maybe shallots if you're feeling adventurous. So onion, garlic, shallots, leeks, and scallions. You saute them. Mm -hmm. Those three things? Yep. In what? What do you saute in these things in? Olive oil. You got to be careful with high high heat. You don't go too hot. Okay. I mean, you're hot enough so they saute, but you're not like scalding anything. Okay. Like the olive oil should never be like smoky. Okay, great. And then... You drain the purple potatoes and the carrots. You add them to the sautéing alliums, onion, garlic, leeks, scallions. Mm -hmm. And you add some vegetable broth. This is arguably the least cool, least rock and roll conversation I've ever had in my entire life. I feel like like it's like a 19th century Pepperidge farm, like farmer's almanac. But you want to know what's kind of messed up is that I'm so amped on the soup story right now, the soup recipe. I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm on the edge of my seat and I'm not actually joking at all. Okay. So you add your potatoes and carrots that are at this point quite soft mm-hmm. to the mixed alliums, garlic, scallions, onions, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You add some sort of broth that I, I make my own. You, you make your own vegetable broth? Yeah. How it's do you do that? It's the easiest thing in the world. You take all the vegetable stuff you don't want and you boil it. What, like carrot tips? Yeah, carrot tops are great. And like onion peels and all the stuff that the by like all the stuff that you wouldn't put in the soup, you put in the veg. you make your vegetable And are broth. you making this vegetable broth simultaneously? I do. So I'll have like four pots going. Oh, you've got so many pots at once. Okay. Yeah. So. It's like you're a DJ of food. 
<laughs> okay, so then you have your allium, garlic, onion, scallions, potatoes, carrots, vegetable broth, all going. And then you pour that. You ready? This is where it gets weird. I can't wait. You pour that into a very good blender. <gasps> you blend it? And you blend it. All of it? Not the lentils and the quinoa and the corn. That stays as is. Okay, okay. You blend the other stuff. You and bl you you're blending all of your carrot, leek, scallions, et cetera, et cetera. and potatoes. And potatoes, carrots, et cetera. Okay. You blend it and then you add it to your lentil, quinoa, corn. Incredible. And you okay. end up with the most wonderful soup. The whole thing takes and about an And you're just hour. tossing the, the broth goes in. The broth goes in when you're after you're done sautéing, you add that broth. And so the ah, broth enable the broth enables you to blend your your stuff. Got it, got it, got it because you're not using the water that was in the potato mixture. No, that gets that you could do something with it, but I I don't get mad at me. I I I chuck that out. I could wow. save it and it could be the base for another vegetable broth. Why don't you use it for that one? Because that liquid shows up at the very end. Oh, And the I other see. broth you've been making the whole time. Okay, okay, But I mean, okay. you could, you, you know what, in the future, I'm going to try and do something with that potato carrot water. Great, amazing. I mean, this has been Soup Corner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> with wait, Richard hold on Hall. a second. Keep talking. Oh, God. Because we got to have Soup Corner music. Moby, so... We, remember when we were in Park City and I was going to give a speech at mm -hmm. that thing? I, I need you to know that I had a whole speech planned out that I'd been practicing. And it was all about the speech went a little something like this up at the top. It went like, you know, Moby as a legendary musician, DJ, producer, this is my soup corner music. writer. But what you don't know about Moby... And I'm going to blow your mind, and sorry, Moby, for revealing so much about you. Moby is actually an incredible... Something you might not know about maybe Moby is that he makes incredible soups. Soups. What do you think about the soup corner music? I like it a lot. You know you want to sing a soup song? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've already, I'm kind, I mean, I live in a state of constant shame and embarrassment, but my 20 minute discussion of making soup has made me feel, I honestly feel like I spent so much time trying to get away from my roots in New England. And all of a sudden I realized like, oh no. Like, I have become <laughs> what I was trying to escape. Because when I was growing up, everyone in my family and all their friends, this is the stuff they would do. Talk they about soup. Talk about soup and play banjos. Like, the end. All roads lead back to soups and banjos. <sighs> I'm so, is this really what has happened? Like, like I've, I've moved to big cities and I've traveled the world and I live in Los Angeles. I'm supposed to be glamorous. And instead, I play banjo and make soup. But you love it. I really do, <laughs> but I'm also Don't yuck your own yum, bro. What? Don't yuck your own yum, bro. Hold on just a what, one more time. <laughs> Don't yuck your own yum. You know what I'm saying? Is this an, is this a, like a, a TikTok a, expression or something? No, it's like a, it's like a thing people like, say. People have said that. I You're, probably, I think I've heard it somewhere. I don't think I made that up. I'm not that clever. No, yuck your own yum. Wow. Okay. Don't yuck your own yum. Okay, I, I... It's a Shakespearean ideology phrased in a very backwoods way. Shall we go th into the mailbag and and pick out a listener question. Yeah, I'm just going to pick one at random, just sticking my hand in the bag. <laughs> That's the sound effect for sticking your hand Whoop, in a mailbag. Okay, I think I got a good one here. Okay. okay, this one's from an actual human being, who I'm not joking, it is an actual human being named Steve Lukritz. And his question is, well, it starts with a comment and ends with a question. I really liked Little Pine and what it stood for. Do you see yourself opening another vegan restaurant someday? Well, it's a great question. So yes, the first, Steve, really good work. The, so the first restaurant I opened was Teeny, 
in New York in 2002. And I was in a very, very different place in my life as a person when I opened it. And so on one hand, I wanted to represent veganism well, but also at that time, like I was drinking constantly. I was a, so I was a drunk. I was doing a lot of drugs. And so Teeny was opened to both represent a nice side of veganism, but also to give me a place to go when I was hungover because I was hungover every single day. And you wanted to have a place to go when you were hungover? Like, yeah, like a cute little place that would make me feel like less of a scumbag when I was hungover. Oh, got it, got it. And Teeny worked out great. I mean, it was I was completely dysfunctional, but the restaurant did surprisingly well considering I was such a mess. And when I ended my involvement with Teeny, I pretty much said I will never open a restaurant again because opening and running a restaurant, it's one of the most stressful things and I don't recommend it for anyone. What would you say makes it so stressful? The fact that every single part of it is complicated and difficult and has to be perfect every second that it's open. Mm -hmm. So the temperature, the food, the drinks, the service, the music, the lighting, everything has to be perfect. If it's not perfect, people leave or they don't come in. Yeah. And you you don't get do-overs. Like it has, it all has to be 100% perfect. And it's super expensive to open a restaurant, super expensive to run a restaurant, like the like all the ordering, the staff, the utilities, like everything about it is stressful and expensive. So then, even though I had vowed to never open another restaurant again, I guess about six or seven years ago, I opened Little Pine here in Los Angeles. And Little Pine was opened for one and only one reason, that I saw food and nice restaurants as being a remarkable aspect of vegan activism. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's great to make movies, have books, podcasts, social media, nonprofit charities, animal sanctuaries, like all these other things that are forms of vegan animal rights activism. But I've seen with other restaurants, you know, like Crossroads, Candle 79, so Little Pine was opened because I realized I didn't know of any restaurants. I knew of vegan restaurants that were high end. I knew of vegan restaurants that had great food, but I didn't know of any vegan restaurants that were very, that had like really nice, thoughtful, modern design that had an amazing wine list, which might seem a little strange for me because I'm sober, mm -hmm. and that had great service and really interesting comfort food. Mm-hmm. Because you know, a lot of vegan places do comfort food. Like we've talked about how I'm a big fan of Doomies. Yeah. But healthy vegan comfort food is harder to find. And sort of like, like beautifully presented high-end comfort food. And so Little Pine was opened for that reason, to like just to represent veganism and animal rights based on attraction, like in a non-didactic, non-hectoring sort of way. Mm -hmm. And also... There's the way I structured it, there was no way for me to ever make money from it. You it know, was all charity. The idea was if money was going to come in, it was going to go right to charity. The mm -hmm. truth is the money that came into Little Pine was a very small percentage of the amount of money I give to charity. You know, it really, it wasn't making money hand over fist. But mm -hmm. I certainly would never in good conscience take a profit from something I had started for activist reasons. Mm -hmm. So, fast forward, the pandemic started. You remember the pandemic? You know, I really do. Okay. So, a good old pandemic started, and the city of Los Angeles, like most cities around the world, said, guess what, restaurants, you all have to shut down. And I just thought, you know what, I'm going to take my efforts and my resources and apply them to different types of activism. Mm -hmm. And so, I ended up selling... Little Pine, the summer of 2020, uh, and it just recently closed down. But I think, I hope, it's reopening as a new vegan restaurant with a different name. That's the rumor that I've heard because the people that bought it from you are also very, very committed vegans and animal mm -hmm. activists. And they then sold it. My understanding is that they sold it to someone who... Is also a committed vegan and yes, rights activist. Yeah. So I'm very hopeful that when Little Pine reopens, it will no longer be called Little Pine, but will be a new, even potentially better version of Little Pine with a different name. So 
the very long-winded way of answering the question is, I hope that I'm never involved with another restaurant again as long as I live, unless I'm eating there. You know, like, (laughs) I love going to restaurants and eating in restaurants, but owning and running restaurants, it's really something that should be left to the people, like heart surgeons and pilots. Like, (laughs) it's the people who really know what they're doing. And I was a dilettante, so it's amazing that like my two restaurants actually ended up doing okay because I had great intentions but no real practical experience and I had no idea what I was doing. Well, you hired a lot of people that I think did know what they were doing, but even I remember when you were running that restaurant or, or had that restaurant, how hard it was constantly. And I used to work in restaurants mm-hmm. and can attest that it's incredibly challenging. Yeah, in our case, we were barely breaking even and again, the money that came in became a very small part of my overall charitable donations for the year. Yeah. Uh, but I will say almost every night we were open, someone would come up to me and tell me how surprised they were that they liked Little Pine so much. I know. I remember my very, very non-vegan father went and was like, hey, this isn't bad, which is about the highest compliment yep. you could ever, ever get from him. That was the goal is to sort of like open the door, like a place that vegans could bring their non-vegan friends and family members and have the non-vegan friends and family members go in with apprehension and end up having a wonderful meal, maybe with like a great bottle of wine. Mm-hmm. And and it maybe it would just change their perspective on veganism. Yep. You know, that was that was the goal. I think it worked at times, but I really I'm just not cut out to open and run another restaurant. You want you want me to show you how to build a choir with only two people? Yes. Okay, well let me let me go. I gotta get my headphones and then we will build a choir. Just you and me. Okay, great. Maybe bagel. Aroo! That's what she'll do. Okay, so building a choir. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? You might be asking yourself. That's that is what I was asking myself. So years and years and years and years and years ago, I read an interview with the guy who had produced Queen and the Cars. I think his name was Roy Thomas Baker. And he was talking about how in some of those records, when there was a huge chorus, a huge choir, it was actually just two or three people singing different aspects of the same part over and over and over again. And he would build, as in like multi-track build the choir with just these few voices. So they're singing like in different notes, notes. different timbres. Yeah. Got it. They're singing along with themselves. So in the album Resound, I had wanted, and even in reprise, I had wanted to use a big gospel choir, but both records were made during the pandemic. And so you can't Like, there's one thing you can't do in a pandemic is have lots and lots and lots of people in a room singing together. Okay. Right? Yeah. So then I decided to do what Roy Thomas Baker did Mm -hmm. and get one or two people to basically build a choir with me. Okay, yeah. And so I would take one person and put them in my studio and have them sing, like, a low part, a mid part, build chord with their voice and then I'd bring another person in to do the exact same thing and so the choirs on reprise and resound is really only two or three people um, just built and built and layered and layered so you're hearing and I don't know if and does this make sense or not no this makes sense it'll to make, me. when we when we do it it'll make perfect sense so okay. it's basically you can hear like 80 voices but it's only three people singing 80 different parts just layered right on top of each layered, other. Layered, and you end up with this beautiful choir. Rich. Rich, huge, beautiful choir that's really just three or four people. The wonders of modern music, people. And in some cases, like on my weird project, the Void Pacific Choir, oftentimes the choirs on those songs, it's just me. Well, like we listened to Beautiful and we heard the chorus of you singing... The punk rock version of Beautiful, which at some point we should release. But yeah, so it's it's this really fun trick slash process of building a choir. And we're going to do it right now, you and me and Bagel. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. I can't wait. I'm excited to do it. So now we have our headphones on. 
-hmm. and you hear that little click track, ding, right? Ding, ding, dong, ding, dong, ding, dong, ding, dong, ding, dong, ding, dong, ding, dong. So that's a click track, just so I can sync everything up. Okay. Okay, so we're going to build, how about an E major chord? So it's just going to be one, just for the proof of what we're doing, we're just going to build this little E major chord. Okay. So the first thing is we're going to sing a low E note. It's my lowest note that I can sing. So here's the note. Mm. How, okay. do you, how do you feel about that? Good. Okay, so on, on the count, of, we'll do, a, I'll count you in. Oh. oh. Ready? One, two, three. Oh. Perfect. That's really, really hard. Now it's this really low. is the B. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, you, how do you feel like that? Good. Oh. Okay. One, two, three. Oh. oh. Now here's the octave. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. One, two, three, four. Oh. oh. Now here's the major third. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, got it, got it, got it. One, two, three, four. Oh. oh. <laughs> now we're going to go up to the higher B. Oh. Oh. Ready? Oh. Okay. One, two, three, four. <laughs> oh. And now <laughs> let's do the major third lower. Oh. oh. Ready? Okay. One, two, three, four. Oh. oh. And now, I don't know if I was doing it right. And now <laughs> let's do the this E again, but with a little more... A little more punch, like, oh. oh. Okay, ready? Okay. One, two, three, four. Oh. oh. And now let's do, if we can, a very high E. This is, okay, you can even do a falsetto. Oh. Ready? Okay. One, two, three, four. Oh. <laughs> now. I like that the most okay no okay one two three four oh. <laughs> and now very like opera okay. oh. Oh. one two three four oh. Oh. okay so what I have done <laughs> is I've taken all of our choir parts mm -hmm. and I've lined them up thanks to our friend the click track. Thanks, click track. And so I'm going to slowly start bringing them in and you'll hear on their own, they're all going to, the, the loop point is going to be awkward as well. But once everything's in, hopefully it'll all make sense. So here, let's start with our first. There's me. There's you. It doesn't sound too inspiring yet, does it? Right? No, it does sound really funny, though. And then so, so far... Oh, no, I was a little flat on that one. Sorry, y'all. And I'm slowly bringing in our parts, and it's sounding... Still sounds a little <laughs> bit awkward, right? But as everything slowly starts to come in, doesn't it sort of start to sound like a choir? It does sound, it does sound like a choir. <laughs> so that is, that's choir basic 101, but it's gonna get more interesting, okay. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there's us as our weird little awkward choir. And then I take that same part and put it through a little pitch shifter, which on its own is going to sound strange. Ready? Sounds strange, right? 
Sounds terrible even. Yeah. But then I sort of blended in with us. And then, uh uh-oh, I got to stop for one second. Hold on. Okay, I'm back. So there's the horrible sounding thing, but it gives it a weird depth that you might not be aware of. And then we're going to add another thing for some depth. And then here's another pitch shift where I've taken the whole thing and brought it down an octave. It sounds strange, right? Yeah, we sound like angry trolls on the mark. (laughs) And then some reverb. In fact, I'm going to change one of these. Hold on just a sec. This might sound, this might not be the beautiful choir I had in mind, but still, we're we're a choir. But that's my fault. I, I No, think... it's my fault. Okay. So here's our choir. And here's the choir with a little bit of pitch adjustment. And here's our low, angry trolls. And let's bring in something a little higher. That's us up an octave. So that's a big choir, right? That sounds like so many people. I mean... And one of them... Well, half of the many people has a really hard time singing. (laughs) But so the point being, that doesn't, that's how you build a choir. I mean, listen, that's just two people in the course of four minutes. And it sounds like a giant room full of people, right? Yeah. Or am I just, is that a leading question? No, I mean, it really does sound. And do you want to make it more crazy? Troll? Should we bring in some more trolls? More trolls, more trolls. Oh, trolls. Oh, no, they're coming. And we want... Let me... Here's the very high stuff. This is up an octave. It sounds like a beautifully imperfect choir of elves and trolls. Yep. On their first day of practice. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I'm going to stop for one second. Ready? Okay, here, stop now. And now I'm going to ask Jonathan, who is in Texas and who's editing this, to take our choir and he's going to pitch tune it, which is going to take our, our roughness here and he's going to make it sound... Very, hopefully, very pretty. I mean, maybe there, maybe he can work his magic on us, or maybe not. Jonathan, I hope you can work your magic to make everyone know that this could be a very beautiful sounding choir of elves and trolls. Because I'm one pitchy bitch. <laughs> Still, that's our choir. I love our choir. If we wanted to be really annoying, I would just let this play for the next eight minutes. <laughs> Let's please spare our poor listeners. They've been through enough. Okay, so we'll slowly bring our little choir out. Should we? We'll end. We'll bring down the pitch, the high up. There's this one effect I just want to show, which is a weird one. which you might think sounds wrong, but it actually gives it quite a lot of depth. So should we, should we end with oh, just- Oh, I like this the best. Yeah, should we end with just the elves and the trolls? Like a very pretty, like, how about this? You know what I'm gonna do? We're gonna say goodbye. We're gonna leave the elves and the trolls. This just sounds like a bunch of learned angels. And but we're moving away from them. Or rather, they're moving away from us. Farewell, learned angels. 
the angels are departing. What do learned angels ride on? Learned angel sleds? Uh, I don't know. Books. Books with wings. <laughs> books with wings? Yeah. Okay, so the... Okay, goodbye, angels. Learned angels. As they slowly depart... angels on your winged books <laughs> wait are they coming back oh god here oh they god. come oh my god no, wait. it's the learned <laughs> angels no it's so it's one of those awkward moments where you hug goodbye and then they're then you see each other again <laughs> i guess this isn't my floor on the elevator oh wait now it is okay now the learned angels <laughs> you know what the learned angels Okay, now they're really going away. Shh. Goodbye, learned angels. <laughs> Fare thee well, learned angel on Wicked Book. Are they coming back? No, no. no. We, already, we already did that gag. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's how you build a choir. That was only two Yay, people in the course of four amazing. minutes. That was amazing. I thought that was going to be so bad because honestly, I am really, really bad at note finding. And I, when we were listening to it, I was like, oh man, I didn't really do a good job of singing the, all the different notes. And then it actually, at the end, the angel choir, as they were leaving, I was like, they sound not so bad. Yeah, that's, and that was four minutes just to an out of tune guitar. That's how you build a choir. Two people, and we created a giant room full of angels on winged books. <laughs> I'm incredibly impressed. That's so cool that you know how to do that. It's fun, isn't it? It's really fun. And you can imagine what you can do in 15 minutes. I can't. I like, can't even imagine. Like you can build these huge, fun, and, and, and in terms of processing, like I'm not very good at pitch correction. Jonathan's really good at that. He'll be tempted to do that. But then at the very end, it redeems itself yeah, because exactly. the angels are just harmonious. Thank you all so much for listening to another episode of Moby Pod. If you're still here, you're a real one, and we are grateful <laughs> for you. <laughs> um, if you want to send us a question, please do at MobyPod at Moby.com. You know what I would like to do at some point oh. is an, an episode that's basically just questions from the people who are listening i would also love that so please send us whatever's on your mind and hopefully we can get to it really really soon if you are liking this podcast please tell your friends about it and like us on your app and comment maybe rate perhaps i don't know how crazy you're feeling today but anything helps and means a lot to us and I also want to take a minute to thank Jonathan Nesvadba, who edits this and does the music production on it. And I want to thank Human Content for getting this podcast out into the world. And then uh, I guess that's everything for now. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see you in two weeks. We'll, we'll see you in two weeks. Bye.